and we're live. Well, let's uh, dive straight in. David, thank you for uh, hosting me here today, and hello, everybody who's uh, joined us. Um, I am speaking with you from Singapore, where I'm on a tour of Asia together with uh, some colleagues, meeting members of the community along the way, and talking about cloud computing and how that is transforming um, the enterprise and the world of startups and uh, all sorts of people who are now able to do things much faster, much more easily and uh, almost certainly, almost always, with Ubuntu, which is, uh, which is really wonderful. I've met, uh, I had the chance to meet uh, leaders of the French Ubuntu community when we were in Paris, uh, and I hope to meet members of uh, the Ubuntu community here on this Asian stretch as well. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to dive in and, uh, and talk through a couple of points for our online summit. This, is, uh, this week is where we will gather together to map out uh, the road to 1510. Uh, and uh, I wanted to highlight what I think are the um, biggest and most profound things going on in the Ubuntu community today. As always, our goal is to bring the very best of the free software world to the very widest possible audience. Uh, and it has been 10 years since the very first group of, we call ourselves the Warthogs, got together to, uh, to, to get that mission underway. So um, I, I suppose I should start with a big thank you to um, all of you who have been part of this wonderful journey uh, over a decade of computing of all sorts. So diving straight in, um, the, uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about is this extraordinary move to convergence in personal computing. You know, the form factors of personal computing have evolved faster during this last 10 years than at any time in the generation before that. And I don't think the disruption is finished yet. You know, when, when we started Ubuntu, people said, ah, the PC, you know, if you're not Windows, you'll never, you'll never um, gain any traction on the PC. Uh, nonetheless, we saw Ubuntu and free software platforms become absolutely central to all kinds of personal computing, not the PC, but all kinds of personal computing. And for developers, uh, we certainly showed that building um, a free software platform that is crisp and clean and classy really um, makes a big difference. Now, four years ago, we mapped out a new vision, a vision of convergence. And um, that convergence is now real today. Right now, you can install software on your phone uh, and have it present for you a desktop experience. That same software can present for you a desktop experience. Now, um, those of you who've been with us on the Unity journey know that uh, our key focus has been in designing so that all of these form factors fit together. And I think as the rest of the world catches up to the idea of convergence, that we, because of that long, thoughtful process, still have the crispest and cleanest and most thoughtfully laid out vision for how all of these different form factors will come together. Now, I, I kind of want to just reflect for a little while about what's great about Ubuntu. First, we are an open platform, and we invite contributions from all over the free software spectrum and all over the proprietary software spectrum, too. You know, I can run Skype on my Ubuntu desktop, and while I would prefer for it to be free software, I enjoy the fact that I can talk to people all over the world and, and I not force my choices onto them, but we can still talk. I think most of us believe that free software and open source produce consistently a higher quality, um, a more secure kind of software. And I think many in the free software community have now also come to understand, in, in large part through leadership within Ubuntu, that design um, can help achieve a better experience, both for developers, for computing professionals, and also for, um, for all of the people we love, all the people who use technology as a way to get other things done. So I think Ubuntu has come to represent um, the, the cleanest, leanest focus on both free software and design for future experiences. And I think it's time now for us really to accelerate that lead. 
But it's also time for us to welcome other people to that to that vision. Um, uh, I think I think it's it's really important for us to be sure that developers who are comfortable developing for GNOME or for KDE feel that their applications will absolutely be welcome in a converged world uh, on Ubuntu. And so I want to extend an invitation to developers across um, all of the desktop environments um, to, to help bring their applications to this converged world, to phones, uh, to tablets, to PCs, and beyond. Um, I think we're, we're seeing an incredible change in the personal computing landscape because of the disruption of mobiles. Um, we've seen companies, even giant companies like Microsoft, completely change their position. I don't know if you saw the announcements from Microsoft's Build Conference, but there were two that caught my eye. Uh, one, of course, was, was their demonstration of a phone that could give you a desktop um, experience. And I think that's a wonderful validation of the ideas that we've we've articulated over the last few years. And I'm proud that we've been the team that has led free software to that vision. Um, but the other was equally interesting, and that was a demonstration of Microsoft's development tooling running on Ubuntu. And I think that's enormously important because it shows that um, we're entering a world where every company understands the value of open environments. And um, that means that there's an opportunity for us to work together across platforms with all sorts of companies to bring applications to this new world. Now, I've had absolutely no conversations with Microsoft on this topic, but I think if we're seeing the world's leading software companies bring their development tools to Ubuntu along with Android and iOS, that there's a reasonable prospect that if we work together as a community and we're open and we're focused and we're generous and we're thoughtful and our story is great, that we can in fact bring all the world's applications to a free software platform. Uh, we'll have to compete, we'll have to be great, but if, like me, you believe that free software um, has the potential to succeed on security and design and experience, then I think we owe it to ourselves um, to give that a go. So I'm, I'm issuing a call uh, to people who participate in every desktop environment. This is a seminal moment in personal computing. Once again, we're about to see personal computing disrupted, transformed, changed. And history shows that if you are there in that moment, then you have the opportunity to bring people with you and to bring people to your platforms. So um, my call is to folks who've worked on all of the Linux desktop environments uh, to set aside our differences, to recognize that the opportunity now is bigger than all of those differences, to create experiences that span phones and tablets and PCs, to bring all of our very best desktop applications, none of which are exclusively on one desktop environment or another, to everybody. And uh, we will, for our part, do what we can to make sure that it is easy for desktop applications from GNOME, KDE, and other desktop environments to be fantastic uh, in Unity in a converged world. Um, I'd like to announce that we are going to ship a device this year with a manufacturer which will fit in your pocket, which will be a phone, and which will give you a desktop experience. So that pocket PC experience is real on Ubuntu. And while I enjoy the race, I also like to win. And I bet you do too. And so it would be lovely for us to drive free software first into the convergence world. It's a great privilege for me to have mapped out that future, to have worked with a team that's really passionate, to have enjoyed participation from such a wide uh, audience. We have such an incredible group that contribute developers to this new version of Ubuntu. Um, and now the prospect of reaching out our arms to um, an, an even wider community of developers um, 
um, to say, if you're going to do convergence, this is the most elegant, the most tasteful, the most secure way to do it. Not to denigrate other people's effort, but just to say that in the business models of today, in the culture of today, uh, in the spirit of openness that we see coming into every aspect of computing today, um, perhaps it's worth us working openly to, uh, to achieve this vision together. There is a real opportunity there. Um, the next area that I think um, is really exciting in Ubuntu today is almost on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, think of all of the devices in your house today that are connected in one way or another, your telephones, your, your actual physical telephones, um, your television, the set-top boxes attached to your television, the um, home gateway router, if you have any switches, those are all electronic devices that are connected, um, cameras, security systems. Um, we're again at one of those decisive moments in history where the um, nature of those devices is going to change. And the opportunity for us as a community is to present the world with a crisp, clean, free firmware, essentially, um, for all of those devices. Now, in the last six months since we, we last had our online summit, um, we launched uh, a new flavor of Ubuntu, a new rendition of Ubuntu. Uh, we call it Snappy Ubuntu. And uh, Snappy Ubuntu is all the same things that you know and like about Ubuntu, all the same kernels and libraries, um, but packaged in a different way, packaged in a way that is really perfect for these classes of devices. These devices are everywhere. They need to be secure. They're in our houses. They have cameras. They have microphones. They need to be secure. Um, but they also are ideally open devices where you can install applications from a wide range of vendors, where you can choose what software you run and when you update it, how you update it. You can manage them. Today, all of these devices are running, many of them are running Linux, but we have no control over that Linux. There's there's, it's very hard to find firmware updates. It's very hard to install applications. Uh, there are some communities that um, that make this work, you know, particularly communities like DDWRT and Tomato, um, who do this for home routers. But I think there's an opportunity for us to essentially bring that to a much wider audience and also to uh, enable those communities who do care about routing, for example, um, to go much faster, to support a much wider range of devices. So I want to give you a little bit of a tour of Snappy Ubuntu Core and, and how it works and why um, we think it could be the free firmware effectively for the world. Now, if you think for a minute about um, Debian-based uh, Ubuntu, right? We present the world with a file system, and it's a well-known file system. We have all the all the good stuff there, and it's fresh. Uh, and then this huge selection of packages, 45,000 packages, which can uh, write anywhere. So when you install a package, uh, it can write anywhere. Anywhere on the file system can be written by any package. And as you add applications, they can start to collide with each other. They can start to overwrite one another's files until it becomes difficult to know who's really responsible for any given piece. Now, uh, what we did with Snappy was we said we wanted to tease those parts apart. So we start with some read-only images, some images that cannot be modified. They can only be replaced entirely. So your kernel is an image like that. And the operating system itself is a, an image like that. We call that a snap, and those are read-only. Making them read-only allows us to do this very elegant thing about um, updating or rolling back and knowing exactly which version of the software is running at any given time. Uh, of course, every device is different, so we do create a space for each snap where it can write some information, the configuration uh, for the kernel, which modules to load and so on, or um, aspects of configuration or, or things that, need, that the OS needs to get, keep track of can be written into a dedicated writable space. And then applications have exactly the same story. We call them snaps again. And those apps each are read-only images, which can only be updated or rolled back, together with a writable area um, or writable areas, which, um, which encapsulate essentially all of the user information around those applications. And so Snappy Ubuntu is everything that you um, uh, 
uh, know about Ubuntu and everything that's familiar to you about Ubuntu, but it also has this tremendous um, uh, crispness that allows you to um, uh, know exactly where you stand with any given uh, file on any given device. So Snappy Ubuntu has the potential to go everywhere. Um, uh, we have we participated, for example, last week in a hackathon uh, that was hosted by GE, and GE first build um, invited people from all over the the US to participate in this hackathon, uh, and they made some incredible devices, some of which ran Snappy. Uh, we're also working with um, uh, network equipment vendors. We took a, a little PC with a bunch of network ports to MWC. And by the end of the week, we had um, uh, F5 load balancer and a, a plug-in in there from Microsoft that was sending data to Azure. We had um, another Snap, which was um, controlling some robots that were on the network. Uh, and so this little x86 switch was suddenly becoming really smart with all kinds of interesting um, capabilities and devices. So um, the opportunity is there to essentially bring this platform to a very wide range of devices and more interestingly to bring a very wide range of capabilities to um, all sorts of platforms. Um, and so there's a new for, uh, new community forming in Ubuntu around Snappy. It has all the things that you'd expect, mailing lists and bug trackers and things like that. Um, it's reusing um, all the same code. This OS Snap effectively is built from our existing archives, from our existing packages. When we update, um, when we have to fix a bug, we fix it in our existing archives with existing packages, and then we build the updated version of that OS Snap. So I want to invite those of you who are hackers and um, inventors to um, look at the snaps that are available. Uh, 1504 ha was the first released version of uh, Snappy Ubuntu. And uh, um, dive in and tell us what you'd like to see fixed. Make some snaps. Um, let's see what's possible in this new world. Um, in, in my mind, um, there's an enormous spectrum of devices that are smart enough to run Ubuntu, interesting enough um, to want to be open and extensible and managed and secure, um, but essentially defined by relatively few applications. Um, uh, some of these are in progress right now uh, with Snappy Ubuntu. Um, I'd like to unleash all of our imaginations um, and, uh, and see what kinds of snaps we can create. Um, you can host those snaps anywhere, GitHub, wherever you like, um, and uh, we will also gladly publish them uh, for you uh, as, uh, under the Ubuntu umbrella um, to the world. In, in the new world of um, smart things, the apps define the object, and this is your opportunity, essentially, to define what's possible with the objects that you care about. And that brings me to the last of the three big legs uh, of um, computing today, where I think Ubuntu is making a huge difference, uh, and that is the cloud. Now, you'll know that Ubuntu is enormously popular on the cloud, um, with nearly um, uh, nearly 70 percent of the workloads on the major public clouds running on Ubuntu. So that means that developers are loving Ubuntu in a cloud environment, and we continue to be interested in figuring out what they need, what they want, how to make it better, how to polish off rough edges. If you have ideas in that regard, please um, please dig in. Um, what we're keen to do is to raise the, the level of collaboration in the free software community um, another notch. You know, Today, we come together and we collaborate around platforms and packages. Um, but I think it's possible, actually, for us to collaborate at a much higher level. Um, uh, across platforms and across clouds. And for us, that's what Juju is all about. Um, so Juju is a way of encapsulating what experts know about um, a piece of software when it's running on the top of the cloud. So this, for example, is a picture of a fancy Hadoop um, infrastructure. Hold on a sec. I just need to let Claire into the room. Hold on. So here we have um, a bunch of uh, charms that encode Hortonworks Hadoop 
uh, that could run on any cloud. And you can see my SQL is on the screen as well. So that is a, um, a collection of software that could be running at any sort of scale. It could be thousands of nodes, or it could be three nodes running, um, running on your desktop. Um, and essentially, that's an encapsulation of those pieces of software that you would find as packages on Ubuntu, or you would find as GitHub, um, running on the cloud in a way that um, you, could, you could stand up very, very easily automatically. Um, this is Docker, for example. This is a distributed system for running Docker applications. Something like six out of seven Docker images on the Docker registry, the Docker hub, are based on Ubuntu. So we know Ubuntu developers love Docker. So here is a distributed system for um, Docker, the way Docker Inc. would like you to run that. Uh, and this is what OpenStack looks like to us, right? This is a set of services. Each service is open source. It's de defined by a charm, which itself is open source. And just by dragging and dropping these things onto a canvas, we are able to stand up an OpenStack cloud on a cloud or on bare metal. Uh, inside each of these boxes, you'll find something called a charm. Um, now, that charm is usually open source as well. Uh, this is Kubernetes. This is Google's Docker command and control system. And the Kubernetes project just pulled in the charms into the upstream code. So now if you check out Kubernetes upstream, you'll see the charms, which are themselves free software, um, and which define the ways in which you can spin this software up on all the clouds, um, uh, hosted upstream. So there's a wonderful opportunity for us to collaborate uh, with the other platforms, Juju and these charms can be written for CentOS and for Windows. So there's a wonderful opportunity for us to collaborate across platforms to enable people to get this software up and running even faster. So this is sort of orthogonal to the traditional packaging. These, the software here might, might come from packages or it might come directly from GitHub. Um, but again, Ubuntu is all about collaborating openly, bringing the best expertise into one place where it's easy to find, and then sharing it evenly so that people can um, uh, uh, get what they need to get done safely, securely. They can get updates safely, securely anywhere um, on any cloud on the internet. So if you dig into a charm, you'll see it has uh, a charm has a page, just like a package has a page. It has instructions. Um, this is the MySQL charm. Um, if you look down on the right there, you'll start to see what's inside that charm. It's really just a, like a package, a collection of scripts and files that encodes all the different things that the cloud needs to know about that software in order to stand it up. If I zoom into this hooks directory over here, this hooks directory essentially contains all of the intelligence of what to do with MySQL when I connect it up to Ceph, for example, uh, when I connect it up to um, other members of a MySQL uh, cluster, when I set it up for high availability, all of that intelligence is encoded as open source in Python or in Shell or in Node.js in these scripts over here. Uh, and so that's something that we can all hack on. All of us who know stuff about how to, how to uh, install software on the cloud, how to scale software on the cloud, how to configure and connect uh, and secure software on the cloud, this is the place to collaborate to make that happen. Okay, well, it's been an amazing uh, six months. Uh, a big welcome to the Ubuntu Mate community, which are now an official part of the family. Thank you to Martin and uh, and his merry men. Um, also, uh, a big uh, welcome to the Ubuntu Core and Snappy cr crowd. Um, there's a very energetic um, uh, mailing list talking about uh, Snappy on uh, autopilots for, um, for drones. Um, and on uh, robots, lots of interesting stuff happening with robotics and Snappy, but also network equipment, switches, routers, uh, gateways, and so on. So welcome to all of you. Uh, a big thank you to uh, leads across the whole community, the community council, um, and uh, the leads of all of these parts of the project. We're a huge project, and we count very, very much on the leads of every part to set a very high standard um, uh, for their um, uh, both of technical leadership, but also of social leadership. Um, keep us all aligned, keep us working uh, well together. I hope that you guys have a fantastic week. Um, you get to talk about the things that you're interested in. We get to figure out how we're going to deliver not just the next version of Ubuntu, but um, the broad platform that powers 
free software in all of those flavors and editions uh, on all of those clouds and now on all of those devices as well. Um, I want to restate um, my enthusiasm for bringing to our converged world, the world that we've led, um, applications from every desktop environment um, and from other platforms. You know, if we've got the if we've got the development tools from every platform on Ubuntu, then and we've got the gaming development tools um, from every platform on Ubuntu, then we um, uh, should do what we can to bring the applications and the games to to the free platforms as well. Um, so thank you to all of those those of you who lead that work. Uh, and last, the um, the teaser trailer uh, for W. And uh, thank you to everybody who made uh, witty and wise suggestions uh, for both adjectives and animals. Uh, and I'm delighted to announce the winning uh, name, which is that the next cycle, our mascot for the next cycle, will be the Wily Werewolf. Um, so thank you all for your um, participation. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, David is going to chair us uh, through through that process. David, are we going to drop them in the chat window here, or should I hop onto an IRC channel? Yes, so essentially, um, just as a reminder for uh, all of you who are asking your questions, uh, you're probably on ubuntuonair.com, there you'll find the chat widget where you can ask your questions. Uh, just remember to paste them, to prepend them with a uh, question in capital letters so that we don't miss any of your questions. Um, for those of you who are not on ubuntuonair.com, you can join directly um, the um, Ubuntu dash UDS dash plenary um, IRC channel. Um, up until now, we've been queuing up some questions, Mark. So I think we'll just uh, start with those. Uh, let me just find the first one. Just bear with me. All right. There seems to be, other than the name itself, uh, there seems to be quite a lot of excitement about Snappy. And the first question is actually from Daniel Holbach. Uh, and he's asking, what's the feedback on Snappy you've heard, uh, you've heard up until now? Um, so feedback's been super encouraging. The, um, the, uh, the crowd who are working with these little embedded devices I, you know, are all brilliant and, of course, capable of doing things um, uh, you know, beyond my imagination, right? They, they can get down and hack on the kernel, they can get right up and hack on the app. Um, but the feedback has been how easy um, it is for them to kind of stand up snappy on a device and then to start making snaps. It's different. It's, it's a different experience because we have to tease all those parts apart. But um, the feedback is that it really solves a bunch of problems that people have had. They've got their app, they've got it running on Linux, and they've got it running on their device. But it solves a bunch of problems. Snappy solves a bunch of problems that they have had in terms of thinking about how they're going to deliver updates to those devices, refresh the applications, address security issues, and manage those devices. So that's really encouraging. Um, the other feedback that we've had is that um, uh, for people who want to build um, ecosystems around their devices, you know, attracting developers, it's much easier to attract developers um, to a shared platform than it is to a fragmented platform. So that's really um, encouraging as well. But there's still lots, lots to do and fix. It's very new. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, bugs and patches welcome. We had some great commentary on the list from a guy who came on and said he'd, he'd worked through all the documentation and found out all the places where, um, where Snappy's moved on since we first wrote the, 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 the docs when it was originally released. So that, that's hugely welcome. Thank you very much. Excellent. So next question uh, from DSG. DGDS, um, could you tell us approx the approximate date of the release of the MX4 with Ubuntu? Uh, will it be before May ends? And uh, also, how long will you support the Nexus 4? Um, two questions I can't answer, I'm afraid. Um, one, because it's it's an, an, an announcement of uh, another company's product, which is not my place to make. But I can tell you that excitement is building on on in both companies. Um, we are full steam ahead, and the launch will, in fact, be bigger than we originally expected in terms of covering more countries, which is very exciting. The precise date is uh, is theirs to reveal. Uh, as for the Nexus 4, I'll leave that up to the engineering teams. I have one, and I think it's quite 
good to to maintain support for older hardware i think it lets us test the applications and so on um, in a less capable environment and um, so i i hope that support for that continues for some time certainly through to 1604 but i in terms of commitments to that i will ask you to ping that question to um, rick spencer and his merry men all right um, copy paste is asking are there any plans for an ubuntu stick uh, such as chrome case uh, sorry chromecast or much stick um great question so I, I really like this new form factor that's emerging of tiny little sort of gum sticks um and in fact i think it's great for the companies who who have been driving that to lead that work uh we are delighted with intel's decision to support ubuntu on their um small uh, uh, uh hdmi device um, and of course, Gumsticks and a number of others have announced similar devices with Ubuntu as well. So it's not really our place to uh, to compete with them or to to control um, the use of Ubuntu in that way. We we rather work with them, support them, um, and, uh, and 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 do our part to uh, to make uh, them be successful. Okay, um, Akiva Thinkpad is asking. Have you ever had conversations with either Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Steve Ballmer, Linus Torvalds, um, Richard Stallman, Tim Cook, or Satya Nadella? What do you do talk about? That's an interesting question. Um, I did meet uh, Bill Gates. I met him um, in a bathroom, actually, as it happened, completely by accident. Um, it was it was quite awkward, but uh, we had a very brief conversation about robotics, which uh, which I thought was interesting. He seemed genuinely interested in. Um, the sort of emerging trends of robotics, and that was about a year before um, before Ubuntu hit uh, hit hit the streets. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think who else you asked. Well, of course, I've met uh, I've met um, uh, Richard Stallman, um, and uh, on numerous occasions uh, had the pl pleasure to meet Linus. Uh, and I have to say that I think Linus is a most extraordinary leader in terms of his clarity of focus on what's important and and what's not uh, it's kind of incredible to me that um, the colonel has so consistently presented or has presented such a consistent set of interfaces to to user space and that's really what enables us to innovate so much because we can count on the colonel essentially maintaining compatibility and being really thoughtful about the way they present that uh, that interface. It's really important, I think, that the underlying stacks um, uh, be very committed to that um, uh, platform stability, just as we're committed in our LTS releases to stability of the of the user space as well. Um, so, you know, they're, they're all characters and interesting people. Um, I'm sorry I never met Steve Jobs. I, I believe him to have been um, a profoundly thoughtful and insightful person too. Okay. So Fagan is asking, specifically when it comes to gaming with convergence as a goal, do you see devices that would have a dock that would add more graphics capability uh, or more disk space, etc.? Well, of course, there are going to be, it's an interesting question, there are going to be edges of the spectrum where um, uh, the capacity required or the specialist capabilities required force you to a particular form factor, right? So, you know, um, uh, uh, I think it's highly likely that I can carry in my pocket all of the functionality I need for lightweight productivity um, as long as I can get to a form factor which lets me be productive, right? I think it's highly unlikely, you know, in the short term that I'll carry in my pocket um, the beefiest, meatiest, biggest, baddest workstation capability, right? Of course, in 10 years' time, what I carry in my pocket will seem to us like today to be an unbelievable amount of computing power. But at any given time, you're going to be able to fit more beef into a workstation, a desktop workstation, than you are going to be able to fit into your pocket. So <clears throat> I think there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's always going to be room for um, not just all the form factors, but also devices that are dedicated for... Um, for example, workstations and so on, and gaming. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't that we can't, it, it, you know, cover a huge amount of what the average person needs most days of the week. And in fact, certainly for all of their lightweight personal computing needs, um, with something that fits in their pocket. If you think of the fact that we're putting 1.8 gigahertz Atom chips into phones today, 
which are which are you know uh, every bit as powerful as the laptops that all the Ubuntu developers were running full time um, when we started. That's uh, that's pretty incredible, and uh, we should we should riff on that. We should make the platforms um, as fun and as easy to use in those form factors and environments as possible. Okay. So the X zero nine nine is asking. You mentioned free and clean firmware for many devices. Are they also going to be open source? Are you going to try and convince convince manufacturers, or do you have a solid reverse engineering team on the tracks? Well, we've always seen uh, a very wide spectrum of devices and a very wide um, uh, spectrum of philosophies about how you know the device and the user should interact. Um, I really don't worry about that too much because I think as long as we present a platform which is available as a free platform, the apps will come to the platform. You know, in a world where devices fragment the landscape, you know, if you think of it uh, of a TiVo device, you know, that's the TiVo device. That's the only way you can get that device. It's kind of locked down, and that's a problem, right? Any interesting app on that device is only available on that device. Well, I suspect what's going to happen is that we can open up the platform. So all the interesting applications are available on many devices. And at that stage, you'll have your choice of devices which are themselves more open or less open. I think it's an important issue, but I also don't think it's the most important issue because people always tend to find a way to work around that sort of constraint or restriction. And, um, and, and, and I think that's healthy. So we will support a full range of business models. Uh, we'll support working with people who've locked their devices and people who insist that their devices are open. Our goal is to try to create an open platform for developers and their applications. And um, I think um, uh, in history, it's always been the case that the open platforms are the ones that have grown and thrived. So we'll let that dynamic take care of itself. All right. Who may is asking, does this mean that I can run multiple versions of Snap package applications at the same time? Can I indeed roll them back? Do all Snap package applications benefit from this? For example, LibreOffice, MonoDevelop, Qt Designer, etc. That's exactly right. You can um, install multiple versions of a Snap and then switch between them. And so you can have an experimental one and a stable one, an experimental one and a stable one, and you can switch between them with a single command. Um, the data is backed up or should be backed up each time you do that so that you, you, um, you have a perfect rollback if things don't work. And over time, we've add, we'll add the ability for the software to test itself so that the rollback is automatic if the upgrade effectively caused a problem. Um, the, uh, the, the, there are lots of cool challenges now in terms of getting snaps of things like LibreOffice. We would really like them. So if uh, if that's something that you're interested in, please climb into the Snappy list. Um, the next version of the phone platform will be Snappy as well. Click was the first generation of Snappy effectively. So um, the phone and the Internet of Things platforms are all going to be Snappy. They'll all use the same kernels. And the difference is just in the OS blob, right? So the personal OS blob is the one that can handle phones and tablets and PCs. And the core OS blob is the one that's designed for distributed devices like Wi-Fi access points or switches or routers. And the next question, Homi again. Um, how do you feel now that Microsoft has basically validated Canonical's approach in regards to convergence? I, I, I'm very proud of the fact that as a free software community, we have placed free software right at the front of the evolution of personal computing. You know, um, I've been part of Linux for many, many years. Linux has been part of my life for many, many years. And there was always a lot of whining and complaining about, you know, the you know reasons why Linux didn't succeed. But I think part of that was that we were always copying the other guy, right? We were always five years, ten years behind and copying the other guy broadly. Here, for the first time, profoundly, we had this vision right at the same time. I think it's hard to speculate as to whether we had it first or they had it first, and I don't think it matters, right? I think we're actually living in a world where if we are sincere and generous and we make a great experience, actually, 
All the applications which run on a Windows converged environment might also run on an Ubuntu converged environment. And I think that might be perfectly good for Microsoft too, because the business models of that software are changing as well. So I'd like us to rise above kind of saying, well, you know, you're copying our ideas. Well, we didn't patent those ideas, right? We, 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 we want people, we, we, we spoke very publicly about that vision because we wanted it to be true. And I think it's exciting for everybody that that vision is coming true. Of course, I'd like us to be out there first. We are going to ship a convergence device and you can be part of shaping that soft, the software that's on it and the experience of the device itself. You can do that for, for with, with Ubuntu. You won't be able to do that, I don't think, with Windows. And, uh, and so that's an opportunity for you to define the future right at the front. So thank you for the question and uh, let's get cracking. All right. So one question to summarize many other questions in that uh, on that similar topic. What was the reason behind the name? Um, and will you write an alliterative blog post as uh, as usual? That's the name behind um, Ubuntu and W. Um, I have written a blog post, and it is scheduled to be live. Ooh, but it's not live yet. Maybe I got the date wrong in my WordPress instance. Let me go and publish that right away. Thank you. Good catch. Excellent. All right. Next one is from Joe Ireland. Um, if someone comes up with an idea for phone hardware that's specifically useful for converged phones, would you be willing to give Ubuntu Edge another go? Um, could you just ask that question again, David? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I was in the middle no of that word. All right. So that's uh, from Joe Ireland. If someone comes up with an idea for phone hardware that's specifically useful for converged phones, would you be willing to give Ubuntu Edge another go? Yes, I think so. Um, I mean, the vision behind the Edge was really to create an aspirational platform uh, 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 to to set to to give manufacturers a reason to go for the very very high end. You know, we thought it was possible, but there wasn't any real reason for just a phone to to go for that very very high end. Now I think we start to see the real reason. Uh, I'm going to be in Korea, and I'd love to meet guys at Samsung to talk about that because you know I think they have the ability to do it. Um, if you work for Samsung, then uh, please reach out to my office, and we'll set up a meeting. Um, but I think the key thing is to um, um, now that the now that the vision is real to 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 work with manufacturers who um, will make great devices. Our focus has to stay on the software, and I'm quite glad actually that. Um, when when we didn't raise everything we needed to raise for the edge, we raised enough to raise attention. Right, people started to think, "Oh, that's very interesting," but we didn't raise enough to do it. The the, the, the result of that is that we've had our attention one hundred percent on the software since then, and uh, and so that's why right now on my desktop right here, if I log out and log back in again, I can log into Unity eight and I can get a desktop experience on on this laptop that I'm on right here with Unity 8, the same Unity 8 that's shipping on the, the BQ Aquarius, right? So that's kind of fantastic. Um, so yes, I would be willing to give the edge a go. I would like to have a Hero device. We have made a commitment to ship a, a device which has this capability, um, but I think it would be interesting to explore doing, you know, shooting for the moon and having the most powerful possible device in your pocket um, and making that an Ubuntu device and making it a convergence device at that. All right. Next question from Merlin. How do you see Juju and things like Kubernetes working together? Aren't they more or less in the same space? Um, that's a great question. Uh, they're at different levels. So we deploy, for example, we deploy um, Kubernetes today. Um, I showed you the um, bundle picture. Let me see if I can find it again. Um, This is Kubernetes, if I just share that. This is the Juju service model of Kubernetes. And you can see what it's essentially doing is it's linking together Docker itself, which would go onto all the machines and provide you with the hosting for the Docker processes. Flannel and etcd, which would essentially create a, 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 an overlay network of addresses for all of those Docker processes. And then the Kubernetes control and coordination system, which essentially structures the Kubernetes model. Now, Kubernetes is really, really good, together with 
um, some of the other Docker control systems like Diego from Pivotal or Docker itself. Um, this, let me see if I can find this version. Yeah, this is Docker itself effectively. Those are really good at running Docker containers. Um, and uh, while Juju will let you manage Docker containers, um, it's more focused on the underlying infrastructure, the software that you install on, on machines. So if you're installing software on machines, then you probably want to be using a Charm and Juju. If you are running the same copy of software and you want developers to essentially be able to commit an image that gets run at, at scale, then you want something based on Docker, of which Kubernetes is a very good one. So they, while they're similar, they kind of work well together. We would be interested in laying down the base infrastructure, taking all of the machines and putting Kubernetes on there, integrating Nagios, integrating all the various components um, that you might um, want to run on the bare metal or in the VMs. And then Kubernetes would present an API, often to a different set of developers, for all the containers and stuff, the Docker process containers that they want to run um, uh, on top of that infrastructure. Does that make sense? There's a bit of a delay between IRC, um, but um, yeah, we'll be watching it for the answer. All right, um, next, question, next question from um, D2KX. Um, any forthcoming updates for Ubuntu Snappy on the Raspberry Pi 2? Um, it's a huge opportunity because it's a popular platform and uh, Raspbian leaves a lot to be desired. So Snappy will definitely be available on the RPi2. There is, in fact, a community contribute, contributed kernel for the RPi2, which I think will, will improve over time. Um, the default 32-bit ARM kernel um, that we publish uh, also works on a couple of other platforms, like BeagleBone Black. Um, but yes, RPi is pretty fantastic. We're, we're um, glad to have a community contributed kernel for it and um, looking forward to working with the manufacturer to get full support for the RPi2 into Snappy. And Casper SWE is asking, will Canonical give the desktop and desktop applications and features, uh, sorry, features more, more, let me just restart again, sorry. So will Canonical give the desktop and desktop applications and features more of this new cycle? Supporting server and, and enterprise type is good, but the desktop, the desktop users feel left out. Well, our, our desktop focus at the moment very much is on the convergence story, right? We, we really care about the desktop. In fact, we're spending a lot on the desktop, but our existing desktop won't converge. It can't run in a phone type environment. The new desktop um, is run by the phone. And so um, what we've done is we've essentially, I think, finalized the core layout of the desktop. And what we're now doing is implementing that, that, that desktop experience that you see in Unity 7 in Unity 8. So that if, the, if you're really interested in that, then please join us. The Unity 8 community is super open. They're a lovely community. Lots of discussions about bugs and features and ways to um, 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 implement things, how to optimize things for different platforms, form factors. Um, I know they would appreciate your, your support and your contributions. The faster we get Unity 8 to be out there and great as a desktop, the faster you'll see um, real progress. So I, for me, it's delicious and great that there are lots of desktop environments on Linux. Um, but I think the big contribution we can make is to, is to, is to pioneer this convergence story. And, uh, and we'd love to have your help in that, bringing applications as snaps to the phone, um, um, essentially gets us converged desktop stories. And I think you'll find that the, the new Unity 8, the infrastructure underneath it is much cleaner than the old Linux desktop, right? We've blown away a lot of the stuff that's been there for 30 years and is really not very pretty under the hood um, and replace it with some sort of a set of stacks that are very clear, clean, clear, well thought out, easy to work with, um, reliable and fast. So, uh, so let's build that desktop together. Excellent. And yeah, do remember everyone to join the Convergence and uh, Unity 8 and Snappy sessions at summit.ubuntu.com. There's quite a lot of them, and it's going to be really exciting UOS in that regard. All right, so we've got about uh, eight minutes left. So I'm going to pick the next question um, from Han um, Hans Lai. Will Unity 8 be the default LTS desktop for 1604? No. Um, Unity 8 will be an option for 1604, 
um, and we'll let the community decide the default for 1604. All right, and um, Akiva is asking, what's your favorite click app on the phone? Um, I find <laughs> I find 2048, um, uh, you know, terribly compulsively addictive. Um, so I enjoy that, and then I also enjoy um, uh, one of the news reading apps where I kind of keep track of um, uh, bits and pieces, and uh, and I often use Google Plus through the through the web app interface to Google Plus as well. Okay. All I'm all I'm missing is Chrome, an IRC client, and a terminal, and a, and a mail client, and then Unity Eight is my whole desktop. So. Um, Let's get cracking, right? I've seen some compelling demos, but I really want the real thing. Excellent. All right. Um, Snippy is asking, what do you think about HoloLens? Well, I think that's another really interesting um, um, uh, perspective on the ev continued evolution of personal computing, right? Um, the important thing to realize is that disruption is never done. You know, it's easy to look back and say, oh, you know, um, uh, such and such won. But the reality is the world keeps disrupting itself and, uh, and riding the, those waves of disruption is very, very interesting. I think having a converged platform is our most important story because it will allow us to springboard into some of those newer areas as well. Uh, but right now, the focus has got to be, let's nail the combination of phone, tablet, and PC. What we have is pretty incredible, you know. It's much more usable, I think, in its design than any other convergence story I've seen. Um, and it's real convergence, unlike the Apple approach of kind of handoff between two platforms. While that's interesting, it's not real convergence. And uh, and we've got it. We've got it. We lead it. We should, we should uh, race as hard as we can, pedal as fast as we can to bring that home. Okay, uh, I should quickly say the question about ClickUp was from just Caracas, which has been pointed uh, an IRC from IRC, not Akira. Sorry for the confusion. So, next question from Bison: um, Could Snappy make a rolling release possible? Yes, Snappy is a rolling release. So, um, in Snappy, we disconnect the devel tree from the stable trees, and so you're either on the devel tree or you're on one of the stable trees. And uh, if you're on the Devel tree, then you keep rolling. So Snappy is a rolling uh, is a rolling Ubuntu. Herbert is asking: Any printer manufacturers working with Snappy? Uh, yes, in fact, we have had uh, conversations where we've printer manufacturers have uh, have called us to ask about Snappy, which is exciting. But uh, I've no products to announce in that regard right now. Uh, but it's kind of cool. Refrigerators on Snappy. Uh, there have been printer conversations, networking equipment conversations. So I think that's really exciting. We're really enabling those companies and those teams to kind of focus on their applications, focus on what makes them great. If I think of how difficult it must be for the DDWRT community, right? They've got to do all the layers in the stack, from the kernel and the baseboard and the SOC all the way up to making a great user experience for people to manage routing and switching and DNS and VPNs and things like that. And I think if uh, if members of that community are interested in making a snap, we can accelerate everything they do because then uh, we already take care of getting the getting the platform sorted out, getting on and off the hardware, handling updates, and so on. And it's extensible, right? They can they can have other applications sitting right next to them, um, allowing each of those communities to focus and uh, and go faster. Okay, and then um, Taybot is asking. Are we going to see big names of apps coming to Ubuntu Touch, um, such as the likes of WhatsApp, Netflix, iPlayer, etc.? Yes. That's a good question. The answer is yes. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, we've got a really long formulated question, but I think I'm just going to read the summary. So what's your stance on bounties for software development? That's interesting. You know, I I tried I tried this approach a number of occasions. I once wrote to the developers of a very famous uh, piece of uh, free software for editing images uh, with a with an offer of a bounty, 
and uh, and got a very pointed response back that developers don't work for money, which was fine. It was it was a little rude the response, but it yeah it was a fair fair point. That's fine. And there is some great research on the awkward intersection of volunteer work and paid work. You know, there's some great research, social science research on how you can really mess things up in a in a functioning community of volunteers. If you start adding money, especially money for some people and not others. Um, but basically, I think it's a good idea. Um, I've never managed to figure out how to do it. We've tried. I tried. Uh, I tried funding work to add a bounty capability to Bugzilla. I, we tried doing this in Launchpad, but we just never managed to get the hang of it. At the end of the day, the problem I saw was that was that it wasn't just enough to create the software. You actually need upstream to care about that, right? Otherwise, it sort of rots. Um, and that's a more difficult social problem to figure out. I do think that we have to fix the business models associated with with free software. You know, today it's too easy for a support contract for free software to be essentially like a blank check across all software to one company, whether that's canonical or Red Hat. Um, and then it's at the discretion of that company what they what they give to different upstream communities, right? And often I think that discretion is poorly exercised. We, for example, um, we send a portion of all the revenue that we earn through Firefox browser back to Mozilla. Um, and it's a very carefully, you know, we have a formula for how we calculate that and we do it regardless. Um, I'd like to do that for more pieces of software. Um, and uh, um, I think that might be a better way to, to figure out how to get people paid full time to work on the wonderful upstream projects that, that make free software project uh, free possible. Um, I think bounties, while interesting, tend to be a little one-off, and so they're difficult for people to build a career around, difficult for people to build a life around, um, and so ultimately sort of unsatisfying. But I might just have not got it right yet, so keep, you know, if you're interested, keep trying. All right, so another question, and we're nearing the end. Uh, what do you think about Wayland? Well, and I think it's a perfectly good piece of software. I think our values, um, uh, including convergence and other priorities, was such that it was important for us to support the team that wanted to build a crisper, cleaner, smaller, more tightly specified graphics display engine. And I'm very proud of the fact that we've done it. Um, I think we have a bad habit in the free software world of not being able to tell the difference between freedom to innovate and, and a pissing contest, right? There are many, many occasions where Canonical has adopted other people's software or created new software um, and then adopted other people's software or, or the other way around, right? And you won't have any of that dynamic innovation if you criticize people from thinking that it's appropriate for them to go and do um, something slightly different. I will also say that if we're going to have a big controversy, we should keep the controversy to the things that matter. And there are about five people in the whole world who need to know what the particular display layer is because app developers don't know or care, right? That's all abstracted by toolkits. So I do find it an unfortunate example of a place where um, politics, fired rivalry and so on have been allowed to, to create nastiness and, um, and, and bad feeling over nothing, right? Over nothing. We, we upgraded to system D, which was a huge change huge change. We did that graciously and we did that invisibly, right? Did anybody even notice when they upgraded from um, uh, 1410 to 1504 that they got system D? I suspect not. Most people didn't, right? And we, that was an enormous amount of work. I think we can expect other communities to be a, 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 as gracious about the things that we choose to innovate on as well, especially when they're of much smaller, more tightly scoped significance. All right, and I think with this, um, we've reached out the end of the session. We've still got um, a few questions, but we've tried to pick um, a good mix of topics and uh, a good mix of uh, different people who ask their questions. Um, however, there's still uh, the whole summit to start this week, and I'm sure you'll have uh, the opportunity to ask these questions either on sessions or also. I would encourage you to join the session uh, on Wednesday at 1700 UTC with Jane Silver, the CEO of Ubuntu, who will um, also be able to answer all of these questions. And uh, I think with this, uh, I'll thank everyone to, uh, for their interesting questions. Um, thank you, Mark, for joining in 
for the um, for the keynote and also for taking everyone's questions. And uh, I'll see you say um, I'll see you tomorrow at the summit, uh, same time. Thank you very much, David, for hosting us. Uh, Barcelona, Singapore, and the rest of the world. It's been great uh, to have this conversation, and um, have a wonderful uh, online summit. It's uh, it's amazing the sort of diversity of perspectives that come together, and I think that's part of why the uh, the end result is uh, so great every six months. So look forward to seeing you uh, all online. All right then. Bye bye everyone, and thank you.